Welcome, everybody. I give a few minutes for people to join. We're going to probably start about one or two minutes after 11, just to let everybody join. I say 11 Pacific, but I'm sure people are coming in from all over. Sir, I can't see that uh, right now with control right now. I can't see the, the chat, but just making sure everybody's populating in. You can see that, right? Yeah, yeah. The numbers are coming cool. up. There's still people awesome. coming in. Awesome. Welcome, everybody. We will get started in another minute here. Uh, for those that don't know, um, uh, we we accidentally scheduled this at the same time of our as our friends over at Trimark. So uh, they are also giving a talk right now. Um, Sarah will let everybody know, but we can we will be recording our webinar and and sharing that out. So uh, if you know anybody that's watching that one too, you can share out this link and they can watch this later. But shout out to them; they're great guys. All right. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so here today, we're going to be defining the undefined or what is tier zero. My name is Justin Kohler. I've got with me Alad Shamir and Jonas Knudsen, and let's get started. Uh, there's some housekeeping uh, items that Sarah will be populating in chat. If you have any questions, just throw them in chat and we'll get to those uh, later. All right. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about the history of secure enterprise access and how tier zero got introduced. We'll go through an academic definition of tier zero. And we will examine Microsoft's original list of tier zero principles and figure out where we either agree or disagree, and then kind of build on that over time. We'll also, uh, what I mean by build on that over time, we're going to read doing future sessions on this. There's no possible way we're going to cover every principle that could be considered tier zero, especially when you incorporate other platforms like Azure AD. So we're going to be introducing how we'll talk about this in the future uh, and, and talk about other principles that we may hit on those future sessions. So why are we talking about this? We want to answer concretely or at least debate uh, what is tier zero or the control plane or privileged access. The existing resources kind of from the start have been vague. So when I say tier zero, people might think domain admins or domain controllers. Those are kind of the historical best to understand, like, you know, the, the starting blocks for what means tier zero. Um, but there's a whole lot outside of that. And if you, you're not aware of what could be outside of that, but is also considered tier zero, then you could be leaving gaps open for adversaries to take advantage of. And so realistically, we can't defend what we can't define. So we're trying to define that in this series so that you can understand potentially different edge cases and make sure you're closing those gaps or just aware uh, of those gaps in your environment. Who's talking about this? So we've got SpectreOps Consulting uh, experts uh, representing that uh, on today's call is Alad Shamir. We've also got Bloodhound and Bloodhound Enterprise experts, and uh, representing that team is Jonas Knudsen. So let's go through a history of the secure enterprise access. I'm going to go through this quickly, um, but just to kind of show you how this got started. So going way back in, to 1999 or thereabouts, Active Directory was launched. And right after that, we got this uh, privilege, like least privilege model. Kind of vague guidance, but it was you know, best practice about just give only that which you need to accomplish your job. And that was kind of it, right? Just if you're an admin, you have this access. If you're a user, you have this access. But realistically, that's kind of where the guidance stopped. And you're uh, left to your own uh, opinions on where you should apply that. Um, you'll notice on the top, I'm going to be talking about kind of the, the directory or the secure enterprise access updates. And on the bottom, I'm going to be talking about some trade craft that's particularly relevant when we talk about these, uh, these directories. So in 2007, we get the pass the hash toolkit by core. And in 2008, Azure's launched right after that, 
there's a really important white paper produced uh, out of Microsoft, um, and it's on Heat Ray. Heat Ray was authored by uh, John Dunnigan, Alice Zhang, and Daniel Simon uh, back in 2009. And it was really the first chance that we got the introduction of the identity attack path or the identity snowball attack. We reference these as just attack paths now. Uh, but this really tried to articulate the risk that was living within these directories as they were getting so complex. They recognized that you could take somebody's account over and use that to do more things than you should. And kind of here's an example of this. This is, if anybody's familiar or used Bloodhound before, you're going to see, you know, this is going to seem pretty familiar, but you get access to David as an adversary. David might be a member of a group, which is nested under another group. They have admin privileges over something. That machine has a service account logged in, and then that service account has some random privilege. So this is where that concept really got started. We're kind of dancing around it. And we knew that past the hash was, was, a, was a risk, but you know, the identity snowball attack and that heat ray white paper, I can't understate how, how, or I can't overstate how important that was. So we get heat ray back in 2009. And then we get movie cats in 2011. And now all of a sudden carving credentials from memory is really easy. So Microsoft, you know, uh, you know, 12 years later from least privilege, uh, I'm not blaming Microsoft. It's just, it's just a complex topic. They come out with this amazing uh, model called tiered administration. And this is really where this first concept of tier zero gets introduced. So you can reference them as crown jewels or tier zero. It's the most sensitive objects in the directory. So we want to protect these above all uh, else. Those tier zero objects, you know, are, are basically if an attacker gets here, it's game over. So uh, there's a whole lot that I could go into on tiered administration. I'm just going to say that, again, that's where the term got introduced. Uh, in 2014, we get additional enhancement on that model with the ESAE or Red Forest model. Now, we've only seen a few environments ever successfully deploy this. It's kind of unwieldy. Um, some folks may try and then uh, stop halfway through because it's, it, it's pretty difficult. Um, then in 2016, we're obviously impartial to this. Uh, we get Bloodhound, which really starts visualizing uh, the attack paths in Active Directory environments. So, you know, we may have been uh, aware that these paths exist, but you know, Bloodhound is really the way that we could visualize that problem. Then we start to see the uh, introduction of a bunch of Azure. Uh, trade craft. And then in 2020, we also, now we get the enterprise access model, which is the current model that is uh, available and in use today. So the enterprise access model uh, is represented here. So uh, there has been a couple changes here and I'll talk about those here in a second. Um, but this is really uh, this really sought to provide guidance in hybrid environments because that was never covered in tiered administration or um, Red Forest. Um, it also does some finer grain splits of tiers one and two. So how should you think about this? So I keep using the term tier zero. Um, Microsoft today uses uh, this term called privileged access or control plane. Um, I, I use tier zero uh, because they're basically the same thing. So tier zero became the control plane in the enterprise access model. Uh, we, we could use them as interchangeable. Uh, most people are familiar with tier zero as a term. Um, it's possible that we could switch in the future to something like privilege access or control plane, but right now tier zero, most people understand what we mean when we say that. And um, if I say privilege access, you might your mind might go off in different routes where I, I don't want it to intend. So we're going to use tier zero for this uh, series. So again, it's important to, to step back and assess why are we here? So the reason why we're talking about this is because we want to prevent that credential shuffle, the identity of snowball attack, you name it. We want to prevent this problem from taking place, right? Oops, went a little bit too far. We don't want to prevent this uh, problem from taking place. We want to prevent those attack paths from getting access to those most sensitive objects or the tier zero objects. But again, if we don't understand what's in there, how are we going to defend it? So we need to get a really clear definition on what is tier zero. 
So a lot. Yeah. So if we want to discuss tier zero, we have to start with a clear tier zero definition as Justin suggested. So we tried to um, find the Microsoft's original definition and it turned out to be more challenging, challenging than we expected. Uh, I think someone mentioned it already in one of the questions that we'll review later that Microsoft actually took it down uh, from their website after they retired the original uh, tier administration model. So we had to go back to the Wayback Machine, if you're familiar with that, to track it down. And we found that the original definition was direct control of enterprise identities in the environment. Tier zero includes accounts, groups, and other assets that have direct or indirect administrative control of Active Directory forests, domains, or domain controllers, and all the assets in it. The security sensitivity of all tier zero assets is equivalent as they are all effectively in control of each other. This definition is a good start, but it is not very clear. And I would argue that it's not accurate either. It starts with direct control, and then it shifts to direct or indirect administrative control. What's direct control and what's indirect control? Is it a contradiction? Is there a difference between control and administrative control? It continues with another qualifier stating, and all assets in it. What if a principal is in control of all assets but one? Is it not tier zero then? What if it's all assets but two? Where do you draw the line? The answer to that might be in the last part of the definition stating that they are all uh, effectively in control of each other. But I would argue that this part of the definition is incorrect and I'll explain why later in this session, hopefully. Oh, gone too far, all right. Okay, so let's break it down and start with understanding what control is and the types of control. Simply put, control is a relationship that can contribute to compromising the controlled asset. And I intentionally say uh, can contribute to compromising rather than can compromise because some attack chains are more elaborate and have several moving parts. So that relationship by itself might not be enough. Now, what is direct and indirect control? Direct control is intuitively understandable. It can mean a couple of things. Uh, one, the controlling principle is one hop away from the controlled asset, like um, SVC pay admin and domain admins in the example on the screen here. It could also mean that control relationships, um, it could also mean that um, the control relationship is explicit. So for example, uh, the ability to add users to groups as in this example, I think that's pretty straightforward. What about indirect control? Indirect control can also mean a couple of things. Um, one, it can mean that control relationship are, relationships are transitive. Uh, so if uh, A controls B and B controls C, uh, then A also controls C through transitivity. It can also mean Implicit control. What's implicit control? Understanding the concept of implicit control requires uh, ret returning to the fundamental principle behind the tiering model, and that is the clean source principle. The clean source principle states that all security dependencies must be as trustworthy as the object being secured. Microsoft made uh, the connection between this principle and the tiering model very clear in the original documentation. They also stated in that documentation that 
any subject in control of an object is a security dependency of that object. Based on that statement alone, there could be security dependencies that are not in control of the dependent object, if you follow you know, simple logic and rules of inference. But I want to take a little leap here and argue that indeed, all security dependencies have a control relationship with a dependent object. And that is how I look at uh, implicit control. I'll give you a couple of examples to make it more clear. The first example is the has session edge. If a user logs on to a host, the host typically has access to the user's anti-hash and Kerberos tickets, and maybe to the user's credentials as well. So at least for a limited time, the host can access remote resources with the user's identity. And if an attacker compromises the host, then the attacker can compromise the user as well. Another example is EDR agents. And nowadays, most EDR agents allow operators and analysts to interrogate the host, which means that they can execute code or execute commands and manipulate the host remotely through the agent. So if an EDR agent, for example, is installed on a domain controller, a remote EDR user can control the domain controller. And if an attacker can gain access to the EDR console, the attacker can also control the domain controller. And one more example is hardware. It can be unrestricted physical access to the hardware or virtual access to the hypervisor. Uh, simply put, if you can access the hardware, you can control the host. For example, um, a hypervisor administrator can compromise all domain controllers running on that hypervisor. Now, before I forget, remember that I told you that I disagree with the statement that all tier zero assets are in control of each other. So this is my uh, proof. This is a great example why it isn't true. The hypervisor might not be domain integrated and might not be accessed from any uh, domain joint workstations. Maybe there is no path whatsoever from domain admin to compromising the hypervisor. However, there is a clear path from compromising the hypervisor to compromising the domain, given that the domain controller runs on the hypervisor. Another example of this, Alad, would be like backup systems, right? Like non-domain join backup systems. So if I'm using some like third-party product or whatever to take snap, you know, backups of my domain, then I, even though it can't necessarily control something, I need to incorporate that into tier zero. Absolutely. Thank you for supporting my, uh, my argument even more. And with exactly. that, I think I can rest my case. And uh, uh, I think you can all agree now that not all tier zero assets are in control of each other. Okay, so now that we all agree, let's uh, introduce a more formal definition of security dependency. If the security of one component relies on the security of another, then it is a security dependency. That means that compromising a security dependency may allow compromising components that depend on it. It is not guaranteed because as I mentioned before, some attacks are more elaborate and have multiple prerequisites. So compromising a security dependency may not be enough for compromising uh, depending components. A simple example is an account protected by MFA. You need uh, a password and let's say an authenticator app. The password is definitely a security dependency and it may contribute to compromising 
the account, if you can also compromise the second factor, the authenticator device, or if you have some bypass. However, even though the password alone is not enough for compromising the account, I'm sure you will all agree that the password should still remain secret and protected appropriately. So putting all these considerations and definitions together, we can finally propose a better definition for tier zero or arguably a, def a better definition for tier zero. I'm a bit biased here. So tier zero is a set of assets in control of enterprise identities and their security dependencies. I think this is more clear and more clean than Microsoft's initial definition. Uh, to be honest, saying and their security dependencies is technically redundant here because security dependencies, as we define it, have control. Uh, but I thought it would help drive the definition home, so I put it in anyway. Over to you, yeah. Jonas, to review the rest. Yeah, so uh, now that we have a, a definition of what we want to consider T0, we can start to, to look at the, the different assets that we want to include in, in tier zero. And uh, we thought it was naturally to, to look at what Microsoft has defined as uh, privilege access um, as it yeah, is their product that we are looking at. And um, they have this list um, defined on uh, one of their, their yeah, online pages for the um, documentation for privilege access strategy. And um, I've copied out the uh, 80, um, or Active Directory um, specific items in the list, uh, which is what we are going to, to look at today. Check out the list yourself if you want to. Um, and you can see here that the list includes both like explicit uh, groups that should be uh, part of like tier zero. And then we also have some, some items that are described in a higher level language. Um, what we are going to, to look at is, um, is these um, groups that are explicitly listed here today. We want to cover everything in this list, um, but yeah, today we are, we are focusing on the, uh, the on-premise AD groups that we have in this list here. Now, the first three uh, groups that we have here that are highlighted, um, we don't really need to discuss a lot about those because we do consider those tier zero because they have full control over most of the essential objects in, in Active Directory, and they are intended for being tier zero. So yeah, there's not a lot to, to say about those other than they belong to tier zero. What I want to mention is that the, the built-in administrators group that um, that is referred to here is the, is the administrators group for the domain controllers. So it's not the local administrators group for uh, domain joint systems, it's just for the domain controllers. Yeah, so this is the list of um, of groups that we will discuss today. And then in a later episode, we will go through some of the other items in, in this list here from Microsoft. So before you get started here in a second, because we're going to go through these individually one by one, I'm going to launch a poll for those playing along who want to who want to take guesses. We're going to we are going to go through each of these. But in, in chat or in the poll function in Zoom here, you can put your vote. So is each one of these that we're going to talk about, do you think that they are tier zero or not? So just quick yes or no, if you want to go while we're playing along, and then you'll get our answer as we go. Go ahead, Jonas. Maybe yeah. give it like 10 seconds or so, you know, let, let me give oh, people yeah. a chance to, uh, to answer without cheating seconds. and seeing what Jonas' answers are. <laughs> I've got, by the way, we've got some cool questions. I'm excited to answer them. Uh, here, there's also some like uh, suggestions for um, personal ways that people have chose to like try to define tier zero themselves because this was uh, obviously there's there's room for debate. Yeah, yeah, and we have had like a lot of discussions internally. Yeah, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, the results coming in from the poll are definitely interested interesting. We have one that's going to be fun to walk through. Or there's a couple actually that are really close, so it's going to be really interesting to go through. That's cool. 
are they still coming in or do you want to continue uh let's just go ahead i think we're good right. they've kind of stabilized so cool yeah so we have uh we have now included these three groups in in our tier zero definition so now let's go through uh the remaining one in, in the list and uh, the first group is uh, back operators and yeah i also want to make make it's very clear that this is the backup operators for domain controllers. It's uh, it's not the backup operators for a uh, domain giant system. This this group here also exists on yeah regular Windows systems, uh, but we are just discussing the one that exists uh, in domain controllers. And because it's on domain controllers, it's also uh, part of, of AD. And this group here has um, a lot of privileges. Um, it can back up uh, files on, on domain controllers, but it can also access uh, registry remotely uh, on domain controllers. And uh, that allows the, the uh, backup readers to dump the uh, stamp database and um, and get the hash for, for example, the domain controller to perform a DC sync and, and compromise the domain. So that is yeah one way that this, this group here can be used to compromise uh, T0. So, there is a, a known tier zero compromise for backup operators. And um, yeah, we define it uh, as part of tier zero. Next group is uh, is one that we have discussed a lot uh, internally, especially Justin and I. Um, it's account operators. Account operators is, is a, yeah. Let me foot stomp, foot stomp what Jonas just said there. It's been probably a year of back and forth on this group in particular, like multiple late Slack conversations. So yeah, can't be understated that even internally we debate these. Yeah. And it is, it is a funky group. Um, by default, it will have uh, full control in the default security descriptor of um, the AD objects uh, user group and computer. Meaning that every time you create a new user or group or computer, a counter arena spell will automatically be granted full control on the object. So unless that that uh, object is later uh, promoted to, for example, to be a member of domain admins, so it will be protected by admin SD holder, a counter arena will have full access over the object. Is there a path to compromise TC through a counter operators? It kind of depends. Um, but in most environments, there will be a path because it's very often that TSO principles do, uh, are not protected by admin SD holder, at least um, a couple of them that you can use then to, to compromise uh, the environment. For example, uh, if you have Azure AD Connect and you have these MSOL accounts that have DC sync privileges, then that account will not be protected by admin SD holder. So account readers can, can compromise that account and yeah, compromise um, TSO. And that's why we, we want to include it in tier zero. That said, we we do recommend to uh, not use the group like Microsoft also do. They they recommend that you should keep the, the group empty. Um, it is possible to remove the permissions of account operators such that uh, it doesn't have full control over tier zero assets. But yeah, it's it's a big exercise and and we think it's it's a better better solution just to keep it empty and uh, included in tier zero. Okay, I, I want to jump in and, and make an observation here. Per the way we define tier zero, a principle might belong to tier zero because it is in control of enterprise identities, even though it is not in control of the enterprise identity infrastructure or the domain controllers. As an attacker, if I can compromise all identities except for those in control of identity infrastructure, except for domain admins, let's say, I'm a very happy man. The only reason attackers want to compromise domain controllers is to compromise identities. If we can compromise identities without touching the domain controllers at all, that's even better for us. So the account operators group is an example of that. And the key admins group is similar. These groups won't let you get domain admin, at least not by default, but they'll allow you to compromise any account that isn't effectively a domain admin. And as an attacker, that's all I want. And that's, that was my argument why account operators 
should definitely be uh, in tier zero. That's when I finally got off the debate. So that that distinction, it is basically a domain admin, but it can't affect domain admins. Like it has all the rights across every object that I could possibly want to manipulate as an attacker, but it itself can't manipulate another domain admin. That was a clear like, yes, okay, that meets the definition. Yeah, so I, I tried to convince you for a year that it should be tier zero and and failed and and Elad, you, you did it in five minutes. So um, yeah, you're just you're just working me down. <laughs> so okay, let's take the next one. So that's the domain controllers uh, group. Um, it's not the domain controllers themselves, um, or the OU called domain controllers. Is is the group that exists in Active Directory that's called domain controllers. Um, and this group here has the privilege to, it has to get changes, all privilege um, against the domain. And um, this privilege here is, is uh, a privilege that you can use in combination with the get changes privilege. And these two privileges together allow you to perform uh, DC sync and yeah, perform the uh, domain controller replication of all the NC hashes of, of, of all the uh, users of the environment. Um, but now this, this privilege here on its own, get changes all, is, is not enough to perform DC, DC sync. So if you are a member of the domain controllers group alone, you will not have a way to, to compromise uh, the environment by itself. So now we fall back to, to this, um, this uh, definition that we made for, for tier zero. Um, and this get changes uh, privilege here is, is what we consider a security dependency. So we still believe that this group here should belong to, to tier zero. Another reason is also that if you grant control over this group here, uh, let's say that you, you grant a tier one admin full control over the group, then that tier one admin could throw, throw out the domain controllers in that group and then break uh, AD replication. Uh, so it will also grant the permission to, to harm tier zero. So it is a, yeah, it is a, a dependency. Now, uh, the next, Group here is group policy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I so right here we're gonna cause some controversy. I'm just gonna throw it out there. So Ooh. keep going. But this one, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, group policy creator and creator owners um, is a group that can create uh, GPOs in the environment. Um, if you look up the definition for the group uh, in Microsoft's uh, documentation. It also mentioned that the group can can uh, edit and modify GPOs, um, but it turns out that the, the group can just will just give you the privilege to to create GPOs by default in the environment. And we, when you create that that GPO, you get uh, permissions on that that uh, GPO. So you cannot really modify GPOs created by uh, domain admins, for example. Um, and you cannot link uh, the GPOs to, to anywhere uh, because that privilege is, is, is not something that this group holds. So it is just a privilege to, to add GPOs to the environment. Uh, so there's not really a, a way that you can abuse this group membership to directly to, to compromise uh, tier zero. You need some other privileges as, as well. And uh, because this privilege of creating GPOs is something that you, you can uh, you can grant to tier one admins or tier two admins so that they can manage uh, workstations and member servers. It is something that's, yeah, should be uh, granted to, to principles outside of tier zero. And that's why we, uh, we would say that this group doesn't belong to, to tier zero. So we, 84% of people said that it is tier zero. So, Ooh, uh, yeah. So, so it'd be interesting to to get feedback on why people thought or if if we missed something that somebody else yeah. is tracking. And this is again, this is a conversation. This is a like uh, we'll get to that at the end of the slide, but we're gonna open it up more publicly too, and again, continue the conversation. So if you think that we are wrong, uh, please let us know. Yeah. I'll, I'll add something. So we had this discussion internally last week, Jonathan and I, and uh, I'll tell you what how I argued against it uh, in that conversation. Uh, so basically, Jonas said, hey, if you have, let's say, generic all on an OU, you also need this uh, membership in this group in order to create a GPO and link it. 
And I said, okay, so this attack specifically requires a GPO on top of that generic one of you, but it doesn't mean that it is um, a security dependency per se. So a counter example that I gave was, let's say you have the credentials for a domain admin account. You also need to be able to connect to a domain controller over whatever protocol, RDP, SMB, whatever, to use those credentials. But it doesn't mean that all the hosts or all the uh, subnets that have that uh, uh, firewall rule that allows them to connect are also in tier zero. So it is required for the attack, but it's not a security dependency. Yeah, that's, now, that's really we, I think it's worth sitting on this for a second. We have uh, some some feedback. Uh, the first one was ransomware deployment is possible with group policy creator owners, but you can only create and then edit those policies that you created. So I can't, as a member of this group, like create a random GPO and link it at the domain head. Yeah. yeah. So you, you can create the GPO, but the GPO will do nothing unless you link it to an OU, to, to a container. Uh, so the, the thing that really allows you to strike your blow is the, is the ability to link it, uh, yeah. not just create it. Yeah, and also to edit uh, TPOs. So yeah, TPOs has, has also like a, a default security descriptor. And um, uh, this group here does not have any privileges in, in that. So, so you, you cannot edit any TPOs that are created by someone else. Um, just Justin asked me earlier, like, what if we are both members of this group and and you create a GPO? Can I edit that GPO afterwards? And and um, I actually had to test that. Uh, and the answer was was no, because like when you create the GPO, you'll become the owner of the object, um, which gives you some privileges over the object, and you will also be granted uh, full control on the uh, on the GPO, so you can modify the GPO that you created yourself. But uh, yeah, it it doesn't grant any permissions for for this group here, so. So this group alone uh, should only give you the permission to to create GPOs, as far as uh, I know. Um, but uh, I'm all ears if if somebody has a a way to abuse it, the group. It sounds like it sounds like linking uh, is something that people agree with. So yeah. So uh, there was uh, I enjoyed the debate. There, there there was another counter argument here. Uh, think about social engineering. You can create a malicious GPO and then social engineer someone into linking it. At this, on, on, the, on the same token, I could say, think about creating a user. I could create a user and then social engineer someone to add it to domain admins. So would you say that anyone that can create users should be, should be considered tier zero? I think you'd agree that that's not the case. Okay, we beat this one to death. Keep going, Jonas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so the next group here, print operators. Um, Again, this is the, the group that exists uh, for domain controllers. Um, and print operators has the privilege by default to log in locally on a domain controller. That means that you need either physical access to a domain controller or access through the hypervisor. So you cannot log in uh, remotely, but you can locally log in to domain controllers. Then print operators also have the, the privilege to load device drivers on domain controllers, and that allows you to, to escalate and become administrator on, on, on the host here. Um, does that mean that we have a path to compromise um, tier zero? It kind of depends, because it depends on whether or not you, you have um, access to a domain controller through like yeah either physical access or access um, through the hypervisor. But uh, yeah, most likely that's that's not going to be the case for most uh, red teamers out there. Um, but yeah, it depends. But um, still, we want to include it in tier zero because we see these privileges on the domain controllers as uh, being security dependencies for controlling the domain controllers. And um, yeah, uh, again, it's also a group that you should probably just leave it empty. Uh, don't use it, but but include it in, in tier zero such that no one that's non tier zero is not added to the group um, at some point. Fifty one percent of people. This. Yeah. Fifty one percent of people agree with us, by the way. <laughs> so it's really oh, close. That's uh, so. The majority. I just want to make a side note about this uh, this group and and some of the groups to follow. Print operators exists 
in Active Directory just because domain controllers are Windows servers. So whatever local groups exist when you promote end up uh, in the directory. Print operators make sense on member servers and on workstations, but they make no sense on domain controllers or in the domain. And we'll see some other groups uh, that are similar. They're only there because of the fact that domain controllers are Windows servers. In practice, if for whatever reason, someone needs to manage printers on a domain controller, which is a bad practice, please don't do that. Then this person, this user, should probably be a domain admin regardless. Let's leave this group empty and some of the other groups that really don't need to exist empty. And if anyone needs to perform these operations on the domain controller, it means that they're probably domain admins. Yeah, I agree. And it's pretty much the, the same case for server operators. Server operators can also log in um, interactively um, locally on the domain controllers. Um, but um, yeah, and then when you log in, you have a lot of privileges as, as uh, server operators. You can, for example, uh, back up uh, files and read all files on domain controllers. So you could read the NCDS uh, database with all the NC hashes of all, all the users in the, in the domain. Um, but uh, yeah, it, again, it falls back to if you can log into the domain controllers and, and that require uh, access. So in this case here, we want to, to add it uh, or include it in CS0 as well, because it, it has these permissions on, on domain controls that we see as security dependencies. Um, and again, we don't uh, we don't recommend to use the group, just keep it uh, empty and, and keep it in, in CS0. Distributed COM users um, is, a, is a special group. Um, it cannot log in on domain controllers by default, uh, but it can launch and activate and use distributed COM objects on domain controllers. Um, so that shouldn't leave you with a, a path to tier, to, to tier zero. At least there's no known path here. Um, but still, we think that uh, these permissions on domain controllers um, to mess with these COM objects is, is, is definitely something that is a security dependency for domain controllers. So again, keep it empty and uh, put it in CSO. And the latter, I've, I think you, you mentioned something about that, that it could be that that could be an attack path if we dived into this group here. Yeah, so there are hundreds and hundreds of COM objects on Windows systems by default that you can potentially instantiate. And I am confident that if we actually did some thorough research and try to figure out if there is such object that um, a member of the distributed COM users group can inst instantiate remotely and uh, result in uh, remote code execution, or even just some manipulation of the file system or something like that, we'll probably find it. Um, it's just such a vast attack surface. Uh, so um, I would definitely say that maybe there is not a known tier zero compromise path for this one, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we found one, if we really look for it. Yeah. You follow, follow a lot on Twitter for that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that upcoming article. <laughs> yeah, it's too late to submit it to, to Black Hat, but uh, maybe next year. <laughs> yeah, so cryptographic operators are kind of similar to distributed COM users in the sense that um, it cannot log in on domain controllers, but it has some some privileges locally on, on the box. And um, yeah, I believe it. if you look up the definition for the group, it's uh, Microsoft states that this group here can perform cryptographic operations on Windows computers. Um, um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, but I think, Elad, you, you looked a bit into it. Yeah, it, it's related to IPsec in specific configurations. It's one of those things that, as I mentioned before, it makes sense on member servers. It's, it makes sense on workstations. It has no... Uh, reason to actually be used uh, as on the domain controller or as a domain group. Uh, leave it empty and monitor it as a tier zero group, but no one should be there. 
but yeah, just to, to make sure I understand it correctly. So it still makes sense to like do IPsec stuff on domain controllers, but in that case, then you will be an admin on the box anyways. Yeah, it's something that only domain domain admins should administer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so without login permissions uh, on the domain controllers, there's, there's no um, no path to compromise tier zero. Um, and again, we want to include it in tier zero because of the security dependency that uh, yeah it gives of having these privileges on the domain controllers. Now, next next one here is uh, is quite different. It's the read only domain controllers group. It's the group. It's not the um, it's not the computers themselves, not the AD computer or the physical servers. Um, it is only the group that we're talking about. And um, I couldn't find before, any. Before you before you answer, Justin, are there any interesting uh, responses Ooh, yeah. on that one? In the uh, this one, we've got around seventy percent of people say yes, it is tier zero. Okay. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I tried to find some compromising privileges uh, for for the group. Um, I might have missed something, but I didn't find anything uh, that you can use to to compromise uh, uh, TCO for the group. Um, so I say there's no way that you can compromise TCO just by being member of this group here. I think when people have answered this question, they might have thought about like. Uh, domain controllers themselves, uh, the read-only domain controllers themselves, because yeah, that, that might be a path from, from those to, to compromise tier zero. That makes sense. But this group here on its own is, is um, I don't think that gives you any permissions that uh, you could use to compromise tier zero. Um, it may be a, a security dependency for the read-only domain controllers, but we don't want to classify them as, as, uh, as tier zero, uh, not yet. At least uh, we will discuss them in a future episode. Um, and because of that, there, it's not a security dependency for for tier zero, and we actually say that the, yeah, it shouldn't be part of tier zero. This group here. So yeah, just, so just, just to, to be clear, just to, um, just to yeah. clarify, sorry, Justin, there are three different things that we can refer to when we say read-only domain controllers. There's the host themselves. There's the computer objects for every RODC, and there's the RODC group. What we're discussing here is the group. If I can add myself to the RODC group, does it actually give me any privileges that will allow me to compromise tier zero? The answer here is no. I was going to make yeah. the same distinction. So yeah, thank you. All right. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Last for that. one. Last one. Schema admins, an interesting group that has uh, full control on the AD schema. So this allows you to modify any uh, um, AD class or AD property, and, and you can go in and, for example, change the security descriptor, uh, the default security descriptor for, for all the classes and, and grant yourself full control over the object type. So the next time um, this kind of object will be created in the environment, you will have immediately full control over the uh, object. So an attacker could use this to yeah create such a, ACs and the, the default uh, security descriptor and wait for the next uh, domain admin or T0 user to be created, for example, or T0 computer. Yeah, anything that's T0 and has, has control. Um, of course, this could be prevented if an organization checks the ACLs before they promote uh, objects to, to T0. But um, we kind of say that we would like to say that there, it depends whether well or not there's this. Um, it, there is an attack path to to compromise to zero, and it will, if it is there, it will require the attacker to to wait for for the next uh, tier zero objects to be created. But uh, we still want to include it in tier zero because it is a privilege that only tier zero principles sh should have to to modify the schema, and uh, yeah, it could be abused to to compromise um, compromise tier zero. And operationally. The best practice for this group is to actually leave it blank. Uh, you, I hope that you are not making schema changes on a regular basis. Uh, so I would say on the rare occasion that you, need, you do need to make some schema change, then just add a single user to that group, make the change, and then remove the user. Uh, you don't need anyone to have these rights permanently. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Okay, so uh, we went through this uh, this list here of, of 80 groups uh, today, and we have uh, put all of them into this uh, tier zero table here. Um, now, this is just a, a small version of the table. We will uh, we have uploaded a, a bigger version with um, some more reasoning text um, to, to GitHub. And we will also release a, a blog post today that links to this GitHub, where you can also read all the argumentation that we had for the different, the different groups. Um, and yeah, the idea is to, to expand this table as we go through this webinar series and, and cover more assets, uh, whether or not we, we think they should belong to TSO. And we would also love to yeah get contributions to, to this uh, list here and, and hear your feedback. And if there's anything that we are missing, then uh, yeah, please uh, point it out and um, we would love to, yeah, to hear it. And here's uh, the link to, uh, to the table on, on GitHub. Um, I believe uh, we will send it in the chat as well, so I can go to the next slide. And if anyone makes a really cool contribution to the list there, uh, we might get invited to the next session to discuss it. Yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to join us here and debate, uh, please, please do. Um, so I'm gonna, for some reason, I can't launch this this next topic. But oh, there I did. Wait, oh, I didn't. Weird. I can't launch it. I was going to ideally, well, and no, nobody can see this. Well, I don't know what's going wrong, but I was going to ask for feedback. Maybe you can just put it in the chat. Um, we'll get to Q&A here in just a second, but uh, these are our topics for next uh, discussion. Now we had to do these kind of basics. You know, Obviously there was some debate, even in the basic ones that we just covered, but we're going to continue this conversation. And so these are some, uh, upcoming topic areas that we will expand into. If any of these are more interesting to you than others, please let us know which ones. Uh, you could throw it in chat because for some reason poll isn't working right now. So, um, oh wait, yep, I still I still don't have access. So uh, if anybody is uh, curious about one of those, let us know. Um, otherwise we will just pick what we think is most interesting. And for those, Going to Black Hat, it's possible that we might do something live here. We're still discussing details, but we thought it might be kind of fun if you wanted to join us at our booth and uh, potentially do that. Uh, we're still on the fence on whether we're going to do that or not, but if we do, uh, we'll let you know, and it'd be fun to, to, if you have hard opinions, come let us know what those are. Go on, Jonas. Yeah. All right. So questions. We got a ton of questions, and I know we, we um, ooh, a lot of people want Pam. Oh, and DNS admins. Yes, we will, we will get to that. Um, okay, so some questions. And uh, this is, you know, we're going to answer questions for as long as we can, probably at least the next 15 to 30 minutes. Um, but thanks for those that joined and have to run to other things. I will try to get to the rest of these. So uh, uh, there's a one question. What are some of the best design resources for implementing the tiered model? So that could be tiered, uh, tiered administration, Red Forest, or enterprise access. I think it means typically right now, enterprise access. Microsoft used to have a good set of articles, but then those have been removed, although you can get them on the Wayback Machine. Use of pause at each tier is often met with pushback, for example. So uh, there are multiple resources, I would say, and um, a lot, and Jonas, I'll give my answer, but please interject. So. Uh, we obviously have opinions here. Um, there's Jonas in the chat. Can you share your um, your blog post that you shared last year? There's also yep. in the in the chat here. We've got uh, one of our partners, Alex from Teal uh, Consulting out of Germany. They help a lot of people with exactly this implementing the tiered model. I know uh, Trimark and Sean Metcalf, um, Sean Metcalf's team uh, does a lot of this. So if you're looking from like the uh, PS or, you know, professional services way of doing this. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have opinions. I'm, I'm not showing our product, but Bloodhound Enterprise is specifically designed to identify some of us. Um, so depending on what you're looking for specifically, if you're looking for more documentation or strategy, um, there's a mix of both product and kind of services that could help with that. Um, I have another, qu another question. Tried to come up with a universal guideline the other day on classifying any Active Directory object. And, and uh, this was this person's like, a, they think it aligns with what's being discussed 
but any feedback would be much appreciated. They said, the effective tier level of any Active Directory object can be determined by the direct or derivative control it can assert over its related objects, and it should always be classified as closest to, tier, uh, to zero if it has reachable high value targets, irrespective of, of the probability of an attack path. Well, that was quite a big statement. A lot in Jonas, I, I don't think I would disagree yeah. with any of that. You guys have any? Yeah, it's, it's, I, I agree. I would say it's like the water level mark, what's the highest level you can reach. And uh, that's how you should uh, uh, define it. Yeah. Uh, I would also make a distinction. So there's the intended control and unintended control. Like in some environments, we see it often, uh, we see that the domain users group has a path to domain admins. Does that mean the domain users should be in tier zero? No, it means that you have a problem that you need to solve. So if uh, the path that you identified there, the control that you identified there is intended, then yes, I agree with your definition. Just keep in mind what you might have discovered is a problem that you need to address. So this one's to you a lot. I could not see how your definition answers how many of the enterprises identities and dependencies have to be controlled by a principle for that principle to be classified as tier zero. Where is that limit? So we, we talked about this because yeah. it's like account so, operators, right? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. All right. So yeah, we, we, we had this discussion internally. Um, and that's a question that actually Justin asked me. And then I answered, well, you got me. I don't, I don't really have a clear cut definition for you. Um, so just, a, just, a, a just before you, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say to restate it, because I was like, what if somebody created a custom group and it had literally the same privileges as account operators, but it had one less person in scope? And that was kind of the bait. That's another way of asking the same thing. Yeah. So first of all, please don't do that. There, there, that, <laughs> that group doesn't exist. Yeah. And there's no reason for it to exist. So please don't do that. Now, let's say you do have such groups for whatever operational reason, it's, and it is required for the way you operate. You're not going to change that. Fair enough. In those cases, I would actually say that it's uh, it depends. There's no universal rule here. It may change from organization to, the organi to, to organization, and it would depend on the risk appetite of the organization. In some organizations, they would say, if anyone has control uh, over 80% of the users, then we want to consider that tier zero. That's a fair definition. That's a fair threshold. If they want to say we want all or nothing, that's also fair. Um, I would say it's, that's down to the organization to uh, to draw the line. I, um, I would yeah. argue uh, that uh, if you have control over one tier zero principle, then you are either tier zero or else you have a tiering violation that you need to fix. Um, if you have control over zero tier zero assets, but all the other assets of the organization, um, it doesn't violate the tiering necessarily, but you still like probably have a, a, a big problem because um, I think in some organization, it makes sense to have a, a tier one super admin account that can control everything uh, except for um, tier zero. But in most organizations, you, you don't want to, to create that group or that user that can do that. Uh, you want to divide it up such that your admins that responsible for system A, B, and C in country A, they can control that and they can only control that. They shouldn't be able to control other tier one systems and also the workstations and, and all that. So um, I think it's it falls back to maybe the least privileged uh, concept um, sometimes, but yeah, that's- yeah. Um, yeah. Just keep in mind, Jonas, what, what you described is in fact the account operators group. Yeah, and we um, did, and we did include it in tier zero. Yeah, that that is true. That is true. Um, but yeah, it's it's built in, so it's already there. So uh, I guess um, yeah. it's built in. It's already there. And Microsoft's advice is to not use it. Yeah, yeah. Leave it empty. So I mentioned it earlier, and he he threw it up in our Q and A. So I'm just going to link it here. The when I mentioned uh, one of our partners helps people actually go through this. They're specifically out of Germany and help a lot of EU uh, folks do this. And I just put their their website here. So uh, what are the best solutions for managing exceptions? For example, unwieldy management systems that can cross multiple tiers and give an escalation path via that system to a higher tier. The most secure solution 
is treat as the most critical tier it touches, but that can severely limit functionality of that system. Is this binary or is it possible to mitigate it enough to frustrate attacks? I think that's a really good question. And uh, yeah. from my experience, uh, like implementing a tiering model as a consultant um, in, in a previous role, that, that was always the big challenge because you have these systems that interact with, with all like tier levels and it's it's super hard to find a solution. Uh, also because admins, uh, they don't want to manage three different instances of, of, of each uh, system that they use. Um, and yeah, that there's a lot of challenging there. Um, I think you can, there, there are some exceptions that you, you can do. Um, for example, we didn't touch a lot of, on that, but for example, when you log into a computer, um, you don't want to leave credentials on that host because that gives that that edge of has session and then you can get compromised. But there are ways that you can actually log in to a computer without leaving credentials. And you can also log in without, uh, for example, if you if you log in with network log on and use Kerberos authentication and your account is protected uh, against Kerberos delegation, at least there's no way I, I know of that you can relay this uh, uh, this uh, login or or dump the credentials. There was some there are some still some scenarios that um, I think it was uh, uh, one of the guys that. Uh, at Google's Project Zero that, that showed that it, it is possible to relay a Kerberos authentication in, in some cases, which makes it even more difficult to, to do that. But I would say that there's there are some scenarios where it, it might make sense from a risk perspective for the organization to choose uh, the easy solution and live with the risk um, if it is super complicated to actually abuse the, uh, the tiering violation. Yeah, it's kind so of like I, I, I want to give you another yeah. perspective. Uh, I, I've I've spent my my almost my entire life on the offensive side, so I'll, my two cents are one: it's true, security is it it comes down to risk management. I agree with you. Um, now, ever since Bloodhound was introduced at I think it was 2016, uh, it became the de facto tool that uh, attackers use to find ways to. Uh, uh, compromise Active Directory. And I'm really happy to say that things have been getting better. Uh, and it's more often than not, we find environments where Bloodhound doesn't find a path from domain users to domain admins, uh, which is good. And then I get asked, OK, so what do I do now? Bloodhound doesn't show me a path. Am I, is it a dead end? So my answer is, let's go back to that. Uh, tiering model and um, red forest model and all these beautiful things that Microsoft retired because they were academic, but not practical. They actually describe the ideal world, at least in terms of on-prem active directory. Every time an organization uh, chooses to ex exempt themselves from anything in that model, they take on some, some risk. So as attackers, what we need to do is try to understand what concessions they've made and try to understand how we can abuse them. Um, and that's how basically attackers compromise environments where Bloodhound can't see the path. Um, so yeah, you can say, OK, I want to accept the risk and uh, be more operationally friendly and take those uh, controversial systems and not secure them as tier zero. But just know that it's just a matter of time until someone like me comes along, identifies that exemption, and abuses it. Cool. Um, so if a role can be misused to compromise, then it's tier zero. So not inherited permissions necessarily. This is when we were getting into your definition uh, a lot, I believe. So if a role can be misused to compromise, then it's considered tier zero, question mark. So not inherited permissions necessarily. If a, use, if a role can be used to compromise tier zero, uh, so if it's by design and that's the way operationally you want things to be, then yeah, you need to consider it tier zero and protect it accordingly. That what's tier zero is a conceptual thing. Basically, it's like it's like classification. Is it top secret or not? If you want to say that it's top secret, no problem, but now it needs to go in the safe. Same thing with tier zero. If you want to classify it as, as tier zero, more power to you. Just know that it has a cost. Um, 
And I would say, yeah, if there is a path, you should. If you want to accept the risk though, it's up to you. Just know that someone sooner or later will abuse that. So here, these are two questions I'm going to answer at the same time. So have you explored or implemented the updated version of the tiering model by Microsoft? So I'm reading that as the enterprise access model. And then the second question are, what are the most successful approaches you've used to implement or detect violations or circumvention attempts to the tiering controls? So uh, there's no way of not saying this. I, the reason why we created Bloodhound Enterprise is to answer specifically that. So um, it, it, it is designed specifically to find all of those violations. So anything outside that you may not know exist. So we, we were originally doing this in Bloodhound, you know, Bloodhound again, it started as a, uh, you know, a way to accomplish our objective as pen testers faster and more efficiently. So we, you know, we'd use it to extend, uh, you know, identify a path. Then we started using it defensively. Well, let's find all of these random paths, but that kind of got unwieldy. There's some, it just wasn't built for that purpose. And that's why we use Bloodhound Enterprise. People use Bloodhound open source though today to do some of this too. And you can, um, Jonas, if you, uh, I'll try to do it in a second. We have this really cool, um, link we can share about how you can use the open source version to like some real clear ways to knock out three really big problems in most active directory environments. So like we deploy in Bloodhound Enterprise and there's really common things that we find all the time uh, that you can actually find in open source too. So if you want to get started there, but that's to answer your direct question, that's why we built Bloodhound Enterprise. I'm not necessarily aware of anything else. Otherwise we wouldn't have built Bloodhound Enterprise. Um, the, uh, and then the, are we have are we explored or implemented the updated version? Yeah, I mean that's that's what we model all of our stuff off now is the enterprise access model. Um, so there, you know, when we when we do things in Bloodhound Enterprise, we're classifying Active Directory on prem objects and Azure objects as tier zero or control plane, and then you're just finding all the violations of that. I would say that when Microsoft retired the original tiering model and replaced it with the enterprise access model, they did loosen some things up. Um, like uh, they introduced intermediaries for access and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I personally, I understand why they did that, but there's definitely some risk introduced by that. In any case, the tiers though, the tiering concept, there was no compromise there. Um, it's, still, it's still the same. Uh, maybe it's more elaborate now, but the same tiering principle concept is still in the new model. Somebody asked a question in chat that's somewhat related that I don't want to lose. Pros and cons for using a red forest design pattern in 2023 still viable or optimal? I'd say if you already have red forest deployed, then there's no reason to kind of mess with that unless you're experiencing pain. If you're going to choose to do something today, I would not recommend going red forest um, because of the very small success factor of that. They actually retired that model because of the issues with it. So I mean, it, it issues with just the, the operational complexity of doing it. Now, if you went through all the steps to do it and you actually did it, more power to you, great. The operational complexity uh, is what makes Red uh, Force deteriorate over time. So in right. the past, when we uh, assessed such environments, usually we found that uh, mistakes were made after the implementation and that's what allowed us to ultimately compromise red forest environments uh do you have any guidance on ways to push back on vendors that encourage organizations to use these groups take for example print operators yes uh yeah so so number one first thing would be justify why they're using it so why are they using something that has some level of control over a tier zero asset? Make them define it. And if they can't define it, then like that, that should be a fault problem. Number one, number two is use something that can show how like, so it's one thing to show the control over that, that object. So like, let's say vendor, vendor thing has, uh, it needs to be in the, uh, print operators group. Well, show, show how accessible that thing is. Um, and I would use Bloodhound to do this. Like I, you could use open source Bloodhound to do this, like show the paths to that thing, like articulate visually how bad of a problem you might be creating. Um, that usually gets management on your side to say like, 
yeah, that's a bad idea. Um, yeah. And it, at least if you do that, and if you still say we're going to do it, you know, if the vendor's like, we have no other option, you must do it. At least you're making that decision eyes wide open um, versus a, I think this is a bad idea, but I can't articulate it. Yeah. I, I wanted to echo that uh, and yeah, keep keep challenging them because um, yeah, I had a, uh, an example um, where I, I worked for a company where uh, they installed this backup solution that had an agent on all the um, all the uh, domain joint devices. Or it was actually an, an AD service account and it was performing a service logon on all the domain joint uh, devices and it was admin everywhere. And this backup solution was like to improve security, but it actually made them so much more vulnerable. Uh, so it was uh, yeah, kind of a disaster to install this this tool here. And uh, yeah, we, we managed to convince the organization that it was a bad move actually for security to to implement this solution. And they had to, to figure out something else, even yeah, like either with, with the, the same vendor or something else, because yeah, it, it didn't make sense. And back to the, um, the thing that I come out earlier with like different systems uh, for different tier levels, it is possible sometimes to choose solutions that are easier to, to get into the tiering model. And sometimes, yeah, not to have these, these systems that um, that breaks the tier model because they are completely overprivileged by, by design by the vendor, um, which is sometimes the, the case. A lot Another of that stuff will change that's... over time too. Like, sorry, a lot, just like, like when, uh, we see this a lot with backup systems in general, or it, there's like something will, that will a log in throughout the environment to accomplish an, a task. That's originally how it got created, you know, maybe eight years ago from the vendor side. And they actually have, in most cases, a more secure way of doing it. And so it's really just like a, a, a double check. Like you might have something in your environment today that was accepted that you actually can make better. If you just ask the vendor, like, Hey, this is presenting this problem. Can you suggest a different way? And they might be like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have this that now, which has less permissions and, um, doesn't have the same problem. Yeah. One more point I wanted to make here is that wh wh why not make everything tier zero? When you add something to tier zero, it means that it needs to get certain protections. It, it comes with a cost financial cost and operational cost. So when a vendor proposes a solution that would make that solution be treated as tier zero, you need to tell them, yeah, you're telling us it's gonna cost us X, but no, we need to now protect it as tier zero. The, the real cost is Y. And when you present it this way, uh, you can make more educated decisions and maybe show the vendor that they're not as competitive as they think they are. Uh, lastly, last question that we have, it looks like you mentioned removing rights of account operators. What are the pros and cons of demoting? Oh, now we got another one. What are the pros and cons of demoting a tier zero asset, i.e. removing abusable rights from account operators and thereby making it a useless group? So again, this is a debate that we had over a year. So like account operators, this is what we would see quite often. Account operators. Uh, doesn't have any control over anything in tier zero, but then like people have created different computer objects and let's just take, uh, if you use, if you're a hybrid environment, you use Azure, you create a server and you create a service account that syncs the directory to Azure AD. Well, that server and the service account ha is controlled by account operators by default. So you have to go and remove those rights. So. The, the, the distinction is, can you do that? Yeah, you could, and you can organize it in a top level OU block inheritance and put all your service accounts and all that stuff. That's one option, but, uh, oh man, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, you can remove but, it. Yeah, there's, there's, ahead, you, you need to, you need to do it, uh, on a continuous basis because when you create new objects, you need to do it again. Um, or you could go in and, and remove all the privileges uh, for account operators in, this, uh, in the AD schema. Um, but then if you remove all the privileges for the group, um, then like you end up basically having the same result as just having the group empty because if it yes. has no permi permissions, then um, it should also be empty, uh, I guess. So of course, if it's 
both empty and has no proteins in the environment, then the, the risk is, is is very low that the, anyone can abuse this, this this group here. If it's empty, still have like uh, high per, uh, permissions in the environment, I guess there's still a risk. But if you, you protect it as a tier zero group, such that like no one can can add members to it uh, except for uh, other tier zero members, then uh, the risk associated with this group is, uh, I think, acceptable. Um, I think it hinges on if the, the group is used today. If the group has members and it's being used today, then you have to make the decision. Do you empty that group or do you remove the rights of that group over other assets and understand that it's basically, you know, tier zero because it has control over literally everything else once you remove those control rights over like the Azure Sync accounts, which uh, spoiler alert in the future, that's a tier zero account. So, uh, or if it, if, if you could just maintain it as empty, then you like, then you can just protect that group. Exactly. Like you're saying, Jonas, like that would be the, be the beneficial way of going that route. Now that is not a one size fits all for every group like that. The account operators is pretty specific. Um, but for that one, that's, that's the distinction we would not uh, you can go through the process of removing everything, but if it's empty or if you can get it empty, then just keep it empty and mark it as tier zero or classify it as tier zero. Uh, one comment uh, about rem re removing access or revoking access. There's a lot you don't know. So take, for example, the backup operators group. The other day, Jonas asked me about, uh, hey, there's another group that has the SE backup and the SE restore privileges. Is it the same? And I said, no, the reason it's no, because the backup operators group actually has more than just these privileges. Uh, Windows and domain controllers, they're, they're made of thousands and thousands and thousands of securable objects. Each securable object has its own uh, discretionary access control list. And are you confident that you really know where are all these ACLs and that you can really revoke all the ACLs in which uh, the account operators have some access somewhere. It's a, it's, it's a big task. And uh, I'm sure that even people that work at Microsoft and actually develop these things might uh, miss something. So uh, be careful there. You, there's often a lot that you don't know when it comes to Windows. So I, I'm going to uh, for, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to get through the rest of these. Also, Alex, uh, it, mentioned something pretty relevant. Um, all of his comments are relevant. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> but Jonas is actually giving a talk on on something very uh, akin to this. Jonas, can, um, just for reference, what's your talk about? So people can check it out if they're curious. Yeah, so Alex and I are giving a talk at, at, at Troopers in, in Germany next week on how to abuse um, uh, or we will cover like these uh, ACL based attack paths in, in Active Directory and, and why it's still a big problem. And um, TLR, uh, which is a, a partner of ours, they are the uh, experts of like actually remediating these attack paths and helping implement uh, the tiering model. Uh, so they will give the share, share their knowledge of like how you can actually get rid of these uh, ACL based attack paths uh, once for all. Um, yeah. So um, cool. And uh, I know that Alex will release uh, something uh, after our talk uh, on, on GitHub, I think, uh, or on their website that you can probably use. So, um, yeah. Cool. So, um, uh, Alad, you mentioned it. We, well, Jonas and Alad, we mentioned a couple different groups that we should keep empty. Um, just to scope the question down, out of the groups we covered, can you uh, drop in which ones in the chat, which ones we would recommend to keep empty? Somebody just asked that. And then, sorry if I missed this. So what's with group policy admins and why is it not considered tier zero? I always thought if we allow people to create GPOs for domain controllers and they're considered tier zero, you can create the GPO, but you can't link it. So just the ability to create something, like you can't do anything with it. So if I'm just, if I add myself to the group policy creators group, I can create GPOs all day, but if I can't link it to anything, then it's kind of irrelevant. Yeah, so in the, in the question you said, what if I can, I thought, I thought that if I could create GPOs for domain controllers, it would be tier zero. If you had a group that could create GPOs specifically for domain controllers, I agree, that would be tier zero. But the default group for uh, GPO creators does not create them for domain controllers, it just creates them. Yeah, and, and, and then, 
Okay. Uh, we we also discussed like so if there's like there's two privileges you need in order to compromise uh, a domain controller through a, a GPO attack and that is um, to be able to link the, the GPO and it, and either to to create a GPO or edit a, an existing GPO um, and the permission to create GPOs and edit GPOs that is something that it's okay to delegate to non tier zero but the the permission to link GPOs to tier zero servers like domain controllers that is the privilege that we see as a security dependency and um, yeah so if any group can can do that then uh, that group would be tier zero or that um, permission would be uh, a, a tiering violation so Matt asked in the in the chat because modify like if I if there's already a GPO created and linked somewhere then I if I get added this was this was my earlier question Jonas and one of the reasons why we kept it out is because even if I get added to the group I'm not I don't have necessarily modify rights over every GPO that already exists it's only over the ones that I create. Yeah, it's it's kind of misleading the description from from Microsoft because it, it does state that you can create and, and modify GPOs, um, but you can only modify the GPOs that you have created. Um, so, yeah, so it doesn't provide any privileges on existing GPOs or, or any future GPOs uh, in the environment created um, this group. Um, so, yeah, that uh, permission needs to be delegated some yeah somewhere else. But it's a good we question. Are, we are about 20 minutes over. Uh, a lot or Jonas, do you have anything else that you want to throw out there? No, I think uh, it was a lot of cool questions. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah. Debate. Yeah, it was really fun uh, debate. Um, it sounds like uh, this was well received. So um, we're looking forward to our next one. Um, hopefully we're at Black Hat. We'll all be at Black Hat. You'll see Jonas uh, Troopers next week if you're going to that. And, but well, certainly the whole team will be out at Black Hat. So if you're coming by there, uh, come come by, come visit, say hi, debate Tier Zero with us potentially. And uh, thanks for joining. And we'll share slides and recording and all that stuff and post the blog here in a second. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you later. Thank you.